Man, what is happening, my YouTube family? Of course, it is your boy, Be New. I'm coming at you on this Thursday. Uh, just want to first and foremost, as always, wish positive vibrations and blessings to everyone uh, who could be listening. And, you know, got some news and notes to take place. Of course, the NBA uh, got off today, second night of the season on yesterday. And there were uh, a few games, and they were all pretty good, of course. Uh, the New York Knicks and the Boston Celtics had an instant classic. They went into double overtime with Jalen Brown just going ham. Of course, uh, uh, Tatum could not give him any help. Uh, he had a horrible night. It looked like he was maybe a little bit gassed. Sometimes it takes a lot out of you to get uh, acclimated to the season. You know, even Reggie Miller said it always would take him a couple of weeks. Uh, just to get going and get your legs under you and your breath and everything else. So with all that being said, I'm not making excuses for Tatum, but had he chipped in just a little bit, that would have been definitely a Boston Celtics victory last night. Uh, and, of course, <laughs> my boy, John Morant, was looking wonderful last night. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think he dropped 37-6-6 six and six at home in the M-Town. And uh, I know... He put a lot on himself before the season, saying that he was one of the best point guards in the league and ranking himself in that conversation. And a lot of people thought he was crazy. But I think being that young and proving what he did last year, especially in that playing game against Golden State and being able to get to the playoffs and actually hang with Utah in some of those games, I think uh, just was a testament to his uh, greatness because he is a great player. And also, let's not, let's, let's not mention, uh, we do have some games that's going on tonight. Uh, it's a doubleheader on TNT. Uh, you have the Mavericks uh, visiting the Hawks, if I'm not mistaken. Of course, that's always interesting because of the, the picks and the trade, of course, with the Atlanta Hawks, uh, with Trey Young and Luka Doncic. Uh, and that's always an interesting matchup. And, of course, we all know how both of their seasons ended respectively last year, uh, both making them a good playoff run in their respective conferences. So that should be a pretty good thing to start it off. Now, also, in the second night of the doubleheader, the second game of the TNT doubleheader, you're going to have the Clippers uh, versus Golden State. Uh, now, of course, we all know Kawhi Leonard is still injured and won't be playing in this game, but it still will be interesting to see how good the Clippers come out looking uh, as they try to go on the run and win as many games as they can until hopefully they can get Kawhi Leonard back from his knee injury. Uh, but nonetheless, that's going to be quite some time before that happens. But at the end of the day, I think there's another game because there's three games on the slate tonight. So if you don't have league pass or whatever it is, I know, you know, y'all youngsters got all kind of ways of watching the game. So make sure if you really want to watch a good game, tune in to uh, the Milwaukee Bucks at the Miami Heat because I think it's the Heat home opener. So, you know, they're going to have a ruckus crowd and, you know, that uh, Giannis, after the other night, had such a great game. They coming out to prove something. But with the new addition of Kyle Lowry to Jimmy Buckets and uh, Bam out of Bayou, uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see. So I cannot wait to uh, kind of tune into that game tonight if I get a chance. Uh, we can always talk about some of that tomorrow. But, uh, of course, we know the Lakers had the night off, and that's what we primarily focus on here on this channel, of course. But the Lakers had the night off, uh, and they're going to have the night off again going on today is Thursday, my bad. So they'll be back in action tomorrow against the Phoenix Suns. So with all that being said, what I would like to do is go ahead and continue my list. I know before the start of the season, I started a top 30 list. And, you know, throughout the course of doing my list, I had some ties along the way because basically I made the list kind of quick. And then I realized, man, I left somebody out. I had to squeeze them in here or there. So now to be honest, once I go back and look at my list, uh, it says top 30. But, you know, with the ties and everything else, it's really a uh, top 40, damn near, basically. So what I'm going to do is when I do a final recap, I'm just going to read them all off or whatever. But uh, what I would like to do now is jump into next as we had got down to it was uh, number 11. Number 11 uh, coming in is no other than Dirt and the Whiskey. Uh, Dirt and the Whiskey to me is one of the great all-time players and I rank him that high just because of the way he was able to play the game, uh, the way he let the game come to him, the way he revolutionized the game from a big man perspective, being able to step out and hit these threes and be so finesse with it in the fallaway shots and the battles that he had. I mean, he was in a tough, he was in a tough Western Conference. So the battles that he had with 
Kobe and Shaq over the years and, and Portland and, and I mean just the battles he had with uh, uh, San Antonio and, and Tim Duncan uh, he, he basically made a name for himself and we know that all time that Dirk Nowitzki uh, is six all time in scoring so that's another reason why I have him up there because he was definitely able to put the ball in the bucket and to be able, and I know he only has one championship and one finals MVP, but look at the team that he beat to do it. He beat that great, he beat that great Miami Heat team. Dirk was able to beat that great Miami Heat team. He led that team, uh, Dallas, to that, to that great finals victory uh, over LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, 4-2, uh, and not just only – Oh, y'all, I just almost ran over a wild turkey, and I bullshit you not. But uh, <laughs> my bad, it kind of threw me off. Uh, luckily, it's, it's not that close to Thanksgiving yet, so he was spared. But anyway, uh, Dirt and the Whiskey ranks this high on my list because, like I said, uh, although he has one championship, it is a great championship because look at all the teams he beat along the way. Uh, the great OKC team with Kevin Durant and Russ uh, also uh, beat Kobe. Uh, Kobe and the Lakers, and they was actually the defending champions at the time with uh, Kobe and, and Lamar Odom and, and uh, Pau Gasol and, and Bynum and company, but they were able to actually sweep them four games to zero. So that shows you the greatness of that Dallas team led by Dirk and Whiskey, uh, and with him coming in so high, uh, as far as being six all-time scoring, you're talking about a 14-time All-Star, 12-time All-NBA, four-time first team, uh, a member of the 50-40-90 club, uh, which so far I think I only had Reggie Miller, uh, who was definitely in my top 20 ranking, who was a member of that 50-40-90 club. But also, not to mention, uh, you know, Dirk Nowitzki was that finals MVP. And let's not forget, he did have another finals appearance in that tough Western Conference when he was going against the likes of the Los Angeles Lakers and uh, the San Antonio Spurs uh, en route to uh, losing to the Miami Heat the first time when it was led by Dwayne Wade and Shaquille O'Neal, if I'm memory not mistaken, back in 2006. So, to me, being able to score that high, uh, you know, I mean, if you're top 10 in scoring, that's saying something for yourself. But six all-time in scoring, uh, that's really saying something for yourself, especially the position that you are playing uh, and being able to revolutionize the game, I think came a lot. Uh, that came a lot into it uh, for his career. Averaged 21 points a game, eight rebounds, three assists. But in his peak, he was averaging 25, 26 a game. We all know Dirk was a complete force of nature, uh, a great offensive player who was damn near unstoppable. Uh, now that you have a KD, uh, now that you have a KD, uh, you don't think about the Dirk as often, but he was the first seven footer. You talking about you never saw a seven footer do the things KD do, or you never saw a seven footer do the things that Dirk did, and that's the reason why I got Dirk so high on that list. So, like I said, number eleven is Dirk uh, coming in, and number ten, of course, we have. Now, this one, when, when I start getting into this top ten, or however you want to call it, I know it's going to be some upset people, but this is where I have it. It's just my humble opinion that number 10, we have Bill Russell. Now, Bill Russell, as we know, is a, a was a track was a track and field athlete. So before anybody says, you know, Bill Russell couldn't play, he played in an era where it was only 10 teams, eight teams, or whatever it was during his time he played, you know, throughout the majority of the 60s, uh, you can't take away from that because the less teams there were, then the more talented the athletes. So the, the, it wasn't watered down. So he was going against the best of the best. It wasn't like he was going against, you know, the bottom feeders. And plus, being a track and field athlete, being able to have, you know, at the time, ranked number six in the world uh, in the high jump and turned down the Olympics because back then you weren't allowed to play two sports. But if he had went to the Olympics, uh, the record that he actually held, somebody actually hit, did the same uh, seven foot high jump uh, over in Sydney, Australia during that year in the Olympics. Uh, and Bill Russell would have tied that. But at the end of the day, we know he was a great athlete. Uh, we know he how he shared the basketball, he sacrificed points. Uh, but to me, what made him so great is his rebounding efforts. Of course, we all know number two all time in rebounding uh, because he was not a scorer, as we all know. 
you know, Bill Russell only averaged 15 points a game, but he was giving you 23 rebounds a game and four assists. And even though he wasn't giving you that many points a game, he's still in the top 150 all-time in the NBA in scoring. But I just didn't break this down on scoring. I broke down on all the extra possessions he was able to give his team and his unselfishness when he could play with, with, with players like uh, Bob Cousy. You understand what I'm saying? And a lot of people, which we can get into this later because I hadn't touched on Will Chamberlain yet, but I will go ahead and let you know that Will is on my list and I do have him higher than Bill Russell, even though Will has the two championships to Bill Russell's 11. But, you know, and I know Bill Russell, what he did off the court uh, speaks way more than the type player that Will was and the things that Bill Russell sacrificed and went through. Uh, he is the goat of all time when it comes to that. If you don't know that Bill Russell, then that's something you might need to look up and research. Uh, but Bill Russell was a pioneer in that regard. But he was 11-time champ, a 5-time MVP, a 12-time All-Star, and 11-time All-NBA. And this was back before they had second and third team NBA, but 11-time All-NBA. Now, you know he had, half, uh, you know, like I said, he had Kuzi and he had Havlicek. And that's why I say when it comes to him and Will Chamberlain, you know, the Celtics just had the better team. You know, and we know Will, you know, played, you know, in, in Philadelphia as well. But at the end of the day, you know, that's where I have Bill Russell ranked. Like I said, number two all-time rebounder in the NBA. And it's been tons of rebounders that came through. You know, tons of rebounders that came through this uh, through this great uh, association. But Bill Russell, man, he was the type who just played hard and with grit. And don't ever forget, Bill Russell would beat your ass. So if you came from wrong for him on the court, you know, but back then you would just get a $25 fine. Look it up and see some of the players he beat up. He, he said, I paid him $25, but you're not going to be bumping your gums and playing dirty out here. So please be, please bleed. Bill Russell was the ultimate, ultimate competitor. But anyway, moving right along from Bill Russell, we're going to go with number nine on my list is Tim Duncan. Now, Tim Duncan, he, he was kind of like Bill Russell and what he sacrificed too because he played with great players like David Robinson, Mono Ginobili, Tony Parker, uh, and he gave you 19 points a game, 11 rebounds. Now, I know Bill did average a lot more rebounds and was way more successful as far as rebounding the ball, but you have to remember, back then, uh, center's main job primarily was to rebound the basketball and Tim Duncan was indeed a power forward and this is uh, played in the era where things were starting to you know the floor was starting to get stretched out a little bit more and of course defense uh, the defense has uh, changed quite a bit as we all know so Tim Duncan I got him on here because uh, ahead of Bill Russell even though Bill Russell has 11 championships but like I said that's a team accomplishment even though players contribute greatly to the championships I do weigh that into it. So Tim Duncan, of course, has five. He's a five-time champion, a three-time finals MVP, a two-time league MVP. But this is what really, really made me put him uh, right up there. And I know Carl Malone, uh, he edged out Carl Malone, who was on my last list at number 12, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, Tim Duncan was a 15-time uh, All-NBA, 10-time first team. 15 time all defense, eight time first team. So, I don't, I mean, all star is a fan vote. You understand what I'm saying? But when you talk about, when you talk about uh, all NBA, and that's by your peers and coaches, you know, media writers, things of that nature, not just fan votes. But at the end of the day, you know, that's where I had Tim Duncan, you know, and Tim Duncan had some great battles over the years, too. And the reason why I also rank him so high, too, is, you know, San Antonio, when he first got to San Antonio, David Robinson tried for years to win a championship and was not capable of doing so. Uh, but when, t when Tim Duncan came, the next year after that, immediately, even though it was a lockout year, they were able to beat the New York Knicks and the great Patrick Ewing and win their first championship. So Tim Duncan came in and made an immediate impact uh, for the San Antonio Spurs in order to make them a championship level team. And really, uh, they haven't been the same since he's gone. They still been, you know, competed, but not, they haven't been competing for championships since Tim Duncan's gone. And of course, Ginobili and Parker too, which was, they had a great run, but you know, Tim Duncan, uh, you know, even in the earlier years when they were battling the Celtics, you gotta think in this, in the second finals that they won, 
uh, they took down Shaq. They took down Kobe. You know, in the ultimate ultimate contest, now Shaq and Kobe had their way with them as well. Uh, you know, when they three peated. But you got to remember the year after that, uh, before the Lakers played the Pistons, you got to realize the year before that they didn't make it to the finals. They got put out by San Antonio. Do you understand what I'm saying? So San Antonio and Tim Duncan uh, beat some great teams along the way. Western Conference uh, battles all the time. And Tim Duncan missed the fundamental. If you needed the buckets, you can count on them. If you needed the paint to be protected, you can count on him. If you needed vision on the court, leadership, all of the different variables that go into being one of the best basketball players of all time, uh, then you can look no further than Tim Duncan. And of course, this team, you know, won his rings when he swept swept LeBron when you know LeBron was badly undermanned. Uh, but you know how great that team was. The, the, the victory over Detroit, you know, that was a great, a great uh, notch on the belt. And of course, the, the last victory over the Miami Heat when D-Wade knees was pretty much gone, and LeBron was pretty much trying to carry most of the load by himself. It was actually the last year that uh, LeBron played in Miami. And those was ultimate battles. So, Tim Duncan, like I said, he's definitely right up there, number nine on my list. So now, now let's get on into it a little bit more. Let's go down to number eight on my list. And he is a current player. And that may be surprising to some of you all that I have a current player uh, number eight on my list. And that player is no other than Kevin Durant. Uh, I know a lot of people will say, well, he's not top 10 scoring, he's not that. But by the time it's all said and done, if Kevin Durant can stay healthy, uh, for the remainder of his career, going down this stretch throughout his prime and dwindling into his career the next four to five years, Kevin Durant can easily finish top 10 scoring, uh, maybe top five. Uh, he is a two-time finals MVP, a two-time champion, uh, would have been three-time champion had he uh, not for the, the injuries because when he and Clay went down, you all know, but I know a lot of you are going to say, well, he was on one of the greatest teams ever and he joined the team. I understand all of that. I understand all that, and I take that into consideration. I take mentality into consideration and all of that, but I still feel like he has a lot left to prove on the court, and when you talk about one of the greatest players, when you talk about one of the greatest players of all time, you have to mention him, and just his battles with LeBron shows you anybody who can compete with somebody as great as LeBron James and can be on that level and mention in the same words as a LeBron James, they pretty damn good. And like I was saying about Dirk, you never saw a seven footer be able to do what they do. The way Kevin Durant can score the ball, uh, can rise up pretty much over anybody, his point of release on the shot is unstoppable uh, when he's in a mid range situation. Uh, the way his three point shots, uh, pretty clutch. We know last year his toe was on the line, but that was a clutch shot. Uh, we even know he hit the three in LeBron's face. That was a clutch shot, even though they was up 2-0 and, oh, and they had a better team. It still was a clutch shot. I don't try to take anything away from Kevin Durant, even though I feel like LeBron James is the better of the two players by a whole lot, especially right now. Kevin Durant still has a lot left to prove. But like I said, uh, Kevin Durant, he averages 27 points a game for his career. Anybody that can get you 27 points a game, seven rebounds and four assists, you would want them on your team for sure. He's a nine-time NBA All-Star. Before it's all said and done, I say he'd be a 15 or 16-time NBA All-Star. He's a four-time scoring champion. And of course, he is a member of that coveted club, uh, the 50-40-20 uh, club. So if you can shoot 50% from the field while also shooting 40% from three and 90% from the free throw line throughout the course of a season, and Dirk was part of that, and that's who I mentioned uh, earlier, then that means you are a hell of a shooter. That means you shoot the ball with a tremendous amount of accuracy because you're taking a lot of threes and you still shoot at a clip of 40%. And that's not in a three-point contest. That's in a game. You understand what I'm telling you? So that is excellent. And that's why I have Kevin Durant uh, right there, uh, number eight. So uh, let's let's keep getting into it. Uh, I'll try to, try to finish this up. Uh, let's go on down to number seven. And number seven is no other than Larry Legend. Uh, Larry Bird, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you what, Larry Bird, uh, I'm fortunate enough that I am old enough to have watched uh, most of them, 
most of Larry Bird's career, even though I was a youngster. Uh, but I still remember watching those battles uh, with Larry Bird against Isaiah Thomas uh, in the Eastern Conference Finals and the semis. Uh, I remember, you know, the, the game when Michael Jordan let off for the 62 or 63. I remember, uh, I remember the steal from Isaiah Thomas that stole the series basically from the Pistons. I remember all of these things, but it's not just that. The reason why I rank Larry Legend so high, and I know he doesn't rank up there all the time in scoring, but let's just remember, Larry only played 12 years. He had a lot of back issues, and I know longevity is part of it. Uh, but at the same time, sports medicine wasn't as good. And Larry Bird, he was the type dude who would just mow his own grass. You know, he'd move his own furniture. You know, he was in back pain, especially those last years. But when he came to the Celtics, in one year, he improved them 34 games. In one year, because they was they were cellar dwellers at the bottom. So in one year, they went from the bottom to the to the top, where they were number one in his first year as a rookie, ranked number one in the Eastern Conference with the best record in the Eastern Conference. So that shows you, even though they did ultimately lose in the Eastern Conference Finals to Dr. J in the great Philadelphia 76ers, uh, that shows you how great you know Larry Bird was because they were not even competing until then. And as Boston became more formidable, you know, with Kevin McHale uh, and the other great players they had, then we know the type of run that Larry Bird went on. But you got to think, Larry Bird was giving you 24 and 10 and 6 a game. So for his career, even if you take out the last two years, you got to think what that average would be. So he's giving you 24 points. So first name 20, last name, last name 10. Larry Bird, who had the court vision that you just did not know. He could easily feed the post, rarely turn the ball over, uh, made some magical passes plenty of times in his career, could fake you out any which kind of way. He's 10-time All-NBA, nine-time first team. So you got to tell me he was in the league for 12 years, and 10 out of the 12 years he was in the league, he was All-NBA and nine-time first team. So nine out of his 12 years, he was first team. He's a 12-time All-Star. So all 12 years he was in the league, he was an All-Star. Uh, three times All-NBA all defense second team. And, of course, he is a member of that coveted 50-40-90 club twice over. <laughs> and not many people did that. Larry Bird did that twice in the season. Twice in the season. Larry Bird was so damn good. Larry Bird came to the stadium one night and told somebody, you know what, I'm going to shoot left-handed tonight. I'm going to take every shot left-handed, including my free throws. And he did. He came out and shot left-handed, hit every one of his free throws, and still and, and finished the game with like 36 or 37 points because that's how great he was. And you might say, I know you guys might say, well, the level of competition, you know, wasn't as great. I would beg to differ. Now, I would say in the 90s, with the addition of all the expansion teams, uh, it did go down somewhat. And as you can see, the scoring did as well. But in the 80s, there was a high level of competition in the NBA. Uh, and you had you had some great teams, you know, like the Philadelphia 76ers, like the Los Angeles Lakers, like the Chicago Bulls, like the Detroit Pistons, like the Phoenix, uh, I mean, like the, uh, Los Angeles like it. So with all that being said, uh, Larry was just a legend in his own time. We all know he's a three-time champion, a two-time finals MVP. Uh, the battles that he had with the Lakers year in and year out, uh, where he could have had even more championships, but it was somebody who else I got on my list. I wonder if you can guess who that is. Maybe a couple of them uh, who ultimately was getting the best of Larry Bird and that Boston Celtic team in some historic battles. Uh, but we will get to that uh, sooner rather than later. But that is uh, Magic Johnson. And probably won't get a chance to talk about Magic today. we get in that on tomorrow's show when we do the breakdown uh, uh the Lakers game against the Phoenix Suns tomorrow, the pregame breakdown tomorrow. But uh, as far as the, as far as the, uh, the list is concerned, I think I'm going to stop it right there uh, for today. I got some things I definitely need to take care of. I got a couple calls I need to make. Uh, but what I did want to let you all know is we still got some other great players left. Let me know in the comments below what you think about my list so far. Oh, like I said, I'm going to reread it again. Like I said, I think it became a 37, top 37, 38 list, which I think is a pretty good list. Personally, myself, I did put a lot of thought into it 
as far as uh, who I rank where. And of course, Larry Bird is definitely in my top 10, even though he's not one of the top scorers of all time because of his short tenure in the league due to his injuries. But Larry Bird, his impact on the team, and that's why I put Tim Duncan in there. When you go on the team and you immediately bring an impact and make them into championship contenders, then that says a lot about what kind of player you are and how good you are and what you bring to a team. So I'm going to stop right there. I will be coming back at y'all later on. But as always, man, this has been your boy, Be New. I'm just saying, man, right on to the real. And much love to the haters. I'm out.